Welcome to the um, RCGP webinar on genomics. My name is um, Iman Rafi, I'm a GP. I am um, co-medical director of clinical innovation research at the RCGP. I'm also um, a joint clinical champion for genomics. This session over the next hour, um, I would like to um, present four talks which cover a range of themes around genomics. The talks will be given by um, four GPs who have each got an interest in, in genomics in their own way. And our first speaker is Dr. Jude Hayward, who's um, joint um, clinical champion for genomics for the RCGP and a GP in Yorkshire. And she's probably one of the few, if only, GPs with a specialist interest in, in genetics. So Jude, you can tell us about familial cancer. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Jude Hayward. Yes, I'm going to talk about familial cancer and genomics today. This slide just, slide just gives an outline of the things I'm going to go through. I'm going to talk about familial cancer, really with a focus on familial breast cancer, risk assessment primarily in primary care, an outline of only of principles of management, and highlight where genomic testing is contributing to advances in familial cancer and cancer in general. Mrs B. So Mrs B comes into our consulting room. My mother had breast cancer when she was very young. She was only 47. And I think what's becoming increasingly common is the sentence then, I want the cancer gene test to see if I'll get breast cancer. So familial cancer shows a multifactorial inheritance pattern. So the blue arrow along the bottom of the slide, everyone who's diagnosed with cancer will sit somewhere on this spectrum. On the left hand side, um, environmental factors in the development of cancer are dominant. And as we move over towards the right hand side, genetic factors become dominant. About 5% of people develop, who develop cancer are diagnosed with it as a result of an underlying inherited cancer syndrome, which is usually represented by a single gene condition. There's an additional 10 to 15% who previously been recognised to have a higher risk on the basis of their family history. It's now known that it's a likely contribution of several genes with individually smaller effect, effects into this risk. And this actually, this multifactorial inheritance pattern um, is true for many common complex conditions, including diabetes and ischemic heart disease. So why is it important to recognise inherited cancer syndromes? This table just summarises the risk for a woman carrying mutations in the following genes. And just, just as an example, a woman who carries a mutation in the BRCA1 gene will have about an 80% risk of developing breast cancer in her lifetime and about a 40% risk of developing ovarian cancer. I've also given Lynch syndrome as an example because there is an associated risk of ovarian, endometrial and colorectal cancer with this condition. So what are the red flags that we should be looking for? An inherited cancer syndrome typically presents at a younger age, may be associated with bilateral cancers and associated with other malignancies as well. But risk assessment in primary care remains essentially the same. The cornerstone is taking a family history in order to assess a woman or a person's risk. And in primary care, our role is in determining whether the woman is at a similar risk to the general population developing cancer or whether she is above the population risk. The NICE guidelines for familial breast cancer summarise the management for people who are at risk of familial breast cancer. I just wanted to pull a couple of things out. It's still important if someone presents with breast symptoms that these should be managed in the first instance as a priority. There was a change in the NICE guidelines such that the only scenarios we would refer directly to the Regional Genetics Service now from primary care would be if there's a known gene mutation in the family or referral is recommended by another genetic service. If these situations are not, do not apply, then we should go back to assessing the family history. This slide summarises this. Patients may be managed in primary care if they are at near population risk. So essentially, if somebody has one relative presenting with unilateral breast cancer over the age of 40 years with no additional factors, they are likely to be at near population risk. And this slide summarises the additional factors on the right hand side. So if someone is assessed as being a near population risk, they should be advised to return if the family history alters, given advice about breast awareness symptoms, national screening programmes, contact details for support groups, and given lifestyle advice around diet, alcohol and smoking, for example, and HRT and contraception. A full discussion of contraception and HRT in this context is out with the scope of this webinar, but just to highlight a couple of things, information is available from the UK MET guidelines, from the NICE guidance on familial breast cancer and on menopause, but I wanted to pick out a couple of key points. The first is that if somebody has a family history of breast cancer but does not carry a gene mutation, then contraceptive use is essentially unrestricted. Even those who carry a gene mutation 
the combined hormonal contraceptives are not are, are not absolutely contraindicated, but may be recommended by a specialist. It's important to consider all the cancer-associated risks with the method. For instance, the combined hormonal contraceptives also reduce the lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. So Mrs B has taken the advice to come back if her family history changes and says now that her sister has been told she has breast cancer too at the age of 42. This slide summarises the referral criteria according to the NICE guidelines. So she fits um, as she now has two relatives with breast cancer at any age and can be offered referral to secondary care, which is usually the local breast unit. So in secondary care, two risk assessments are performed. The first is the woman's lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. This is used to stratify her further into the moderate or the high risk group and on the basis of this, recommendations are made around screening and also risk reducing measures such as tamoxifen or anastrozole. The second risk assessment is the risk of carrying a gene to or, or a pathogenic variant in BRCA or one of the other genes. At this point, I'm just going to explain that traditionally, or in the past, the word mutation has been used. This is being replaced by the terminology pathogenic variant or disease-causing variant. So the breast units use a, a scoring system in order to identify those women who have a higher than 10% chance of um, carrying a BRCA mutation in the BRCA1 or 2 genes. And factors which contribute to this are unusual family history or Jewish Ashkenazi ancestry. So I've been talking about genetics so far. This is the discussion of single gene diseases and what is genomics. Genomic encompasses genetics but refers to a person's entire genetic code or DNA, their genome and the technologies allied to this. And genomic medicine refers to the application of genomics to the clinical care of patients. Regional genetic services are now um, coming under the umbrellas of genomic medicine centres. So within genomics medicine centres, the principles will still apply of assessing a woman's risk, giving advice about surveillance or screening, advising regarding risk-reducing measures and consideration for genetic or genomic testing. In the past, this has generally been single gene testing, but increasingly multiple genes are being tested in at one time through testing of gene panels. And this is particularly helpful if a family history doesn't fit neatly into one gene. Also, if usual NHS testing does not reveal any abnormality, some patients may be eligible for whole genome sequencing under the 100,000 Genomes Project. The 100,000 Genomes Project is recruiting people in order to sequence 100,000 genomes and is primarily aimed at cancer and rare disease. So just to illustrate, if someone is found to carry a BRCA1 or 2 pathogenic variant, it changes their risk significantly. Screening becomes earlier and more intensive. Risk-reducing options can include surgical options. And there are additional implications for family members in terms of their risk and whether they can be offered predictive testing for the same variant. To move on to talking about genomic testing in the context of ovarian cancer. It has recently been recognised that 13% of patients diagnosed with ovarian cancer will carry a pathogenic variant in the BRCA1 or 2 gene. A group in London pioneered a process which they've called mainstreaming cancer genetics, which supports people in secondary care in, genetic, in counselling people for genetic or genomic testing and in giving the results, and this is being rolled out nationally now. Genomics is also playing an increasing role in targeted cancer treatment. I've talked so far about germline DNA testing, so testing our constitutional DNA in every cell in our body, the DNA that is inherited. A laparib is an example that's only effective in people who carry a variant, in the, a pathogenic variant in the BRCA1 or 2 gene and is now a third-line treatment for women with ovarian cancer. In addition, testing may be somatic, so just on the cancer genome, the DNA from the cancer. And an example of this is HER2 testing in breast cancer to predict response to Herceptin. Another example is BRAF inhibitors in treatment of melanoma, and examples are increasing all the time. So access to genomic testing is increasing, and there are several factors contributing to this. Changing criteria for testing within routine clinical care, mainstreaming genomic testing in secondary care, genomic testing of cancers themselves, testing of multiple genes simultaneously, the 100,000 Genome Project, and also increasing availability of commercial testing which people can access directly without coming through the NHS. I've got two final slides on the family history of colorectal and ovarian cancer, which I am going to just mention in passing in the interests of time. But the principles are the same, assessing whether a patient is at near population risk, giving the relevant advice and referring as appropriate. A couple of points to pick out about a family history of ovarian cancer. Screening asymptomatic women using CA125 and ultrasound scan has not been proven effective and should not be offered routinely. In these patients, um, their family history can be re reviewed and the referral criteria to genomics medicine centres are below. 
crucially, more women are now eligible for BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing if there is a family history of ovarian cancer. So in summary, around 5% of cancer results from an inherited cancer syndrome. In primary care, the cornerstone is still risk assessment using the family history and clustering of any cancer in a family may be a red flag. There are common management principles. Genomic testing is advancing knowledge of familial cancer and inherited cancer syndromes in addition to targeted treatment for cancer. And that undoubtedly, this increasing access to genomic testing will impact on primary care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jude. Um, so, Jude, I've just got um, a couple of questions for you. One is, um, what tools do we have in primary care that will enable us to calculate risk you know, for, for all these cancers? Because it's quite complex, isn't it? It is very complex. And for the cancers that I've mentioned, for breast and ovarian and colorectal cancer, there are recognised guidelines. I've mentioned the NICE guidelines for familial cancer. And the British Society for Gastroenterology have also produced guidelines, which were summarised in the previous slide. But just to come back to the general rule of thumb, if people have a family history of three relatives with the same cancer over about 60 years of age, two relatives less than 60 years of age, then we should consider the possibility of an inherited familial cancer syndrome. Thank you. And complexity, because um, I know you're doing um, an MSc in, in medical genomics, which is being funded by HEE. Have you done your cancer module and what struck you about advances in, in cancer care? Yeah, so I have done the cancer module. Um, it, was, it was extremely interesting. I should say it related purely to, the, or, or almost purely to the somatic testing of cancer. Um, there, there was a reference to familial cancer, but mostly to the um, somatic testing of cancer. And I think what struck me was just the, the rapidly increasing number of targeted treatments. So I've mentioned a couple. We're going to come across more and more in primary care as time goes on. Great. Thank you very much, Hugh. That was very good. Thank you.